uh, Joel chapter 2. And I'd like to focus on the little section in the middle there. Joel chapter 2, verse 12, starting, and I'll read through verse 17, and I'd like you to follow along as I read it. Joel chapter 2, the second book of the Minor Prophets, there before the New Testament starts, uh, in verse 12. It says, yet even now declares Yahweh, return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and wailing. And tear your heart and not your garments. Now return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting concerning evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him even a grain offering and a drink offering for Yahweh your God. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Set apart a fast as holy. Call for a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Set apart the congregation as holy. Assemble the elders. Gather the infants and the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the ministers of Yahweh, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, pity your people, O Yahweh, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? This is the very word of the living God. I pray that we would write it on our hearts today, even now. The minor prophets, they're a a funny place to find yourself in the morning. There's 12 of them. Uh, They're not minor because they're insignificant. They're minor because you're short, but you know that because you take Bible classes at gunpoint. So (laughs) uh, I'm sure you're aware uh, of these little books. We've been studying them at church on Sunday nights, and, and the book of Joel snuck up on me and, and surprised me with, with how important its message is, and not to the people I, I talk to, but to, to me. Um, it, it's been a, a book that's been revealing to me. You know, I grew up in, in the church, and I remember uh, being in a tradition that was uh, very enthusiastic about the return of Jesus. Uh, so at church, like on Sunday nights, we'd watch the movies where uh, Jesus would, would come back, the rapture would happen, and you know, it was, this was before Kirk Cameron did his thing. Um, but these were the older version of those movies where they were beheading the Christians and chasing them, and, and they would disappear. And, and those movies haunted me quite a bit, and, and I, I can't say they didn't inform my eschatology even to this minute, but... Um, I remember coming home from school and wondering, you know, if I got left behind because my parents weren't home. It was kind of a regular occurrence for me. Um, and it's because my parents abandoned me when I was six. And, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> got dark. Uh, no, but I, I just remember having like this, this kind of intensified understanding of how you know, the end of all things occurs. And, and places like the book of Joel were often referenced because there is a lot about something called the day of the Lord, a day of future judgment and wrath that the Bible talks about with regularity. Um, and I think because of that influence, I, I'd always thought of the book of Joel in those terms. Um, there's a description of, of something at the beginning of, of this book. And, and I was told as a kid that this was, you know, a Russian invasion, and these are some kind of helicopters coming at people. And so I think my, my understanding of so much of this book was kind of colored by that, that I missed the actual heartfelt message that this preacher had for his audience. And really to understand the Bible, you don't need to understand the, the future well. You should just understand what the Scripture is saying to you. And that's particularly true in this this book of Joel. And the passage I want to look at today is, I think it's a simple passage that everybody heard it read, and you know it's a passage about repentance. Uh, 
passage about genuine repentance, a passage about calling people back to the Lord. And that's a very relevant message. And to understand it, I want you to understand what's happening in the book of Joel. So let me just look at this in three parts is what I'm thinking. Three parts. Uh, one, let's start with a bug's life, a bug's life, okay? I know, you, I know what you know. Number two, uh, let's talk about a sinner's vocation, a sinner's vocation, a sinner's job. And then let's, number three, talk about a, at our God's heart, okay? So let's just kind of approach this, this text in Joel chapter two with those three kind of frameworks in mind. So let's begin with a bug's life. Uh, because there isn't a, a description of Apache helicopters uh, dropping bombs on your moms in the book of Joel. Let me read it to you and, and let you understand that it's being quite straightforward about uh, wh what's happening in this context. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. The word of Yahweh that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and give ear all inhabitants of the land. Or has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Recount about it to your sons. Let your sons recount it about to their sons. Let their sons to the next generation. Something remarkable, something unparalleled has happened in Joel's day. And as a matter of fact, we don't know anything about Joel's day except that something traumatic happened. Unlike other prophets, Hosea, who goes before him, there's no association with a king. We simply know his dad's name was Pethuel, that his name was Joel, a relatively common name in the Old Testament. There's 12 different Joels. Uh, and we don't know anything about when he served Yahweh. We know he was likely in Judah. That, that's about all we've got. And so the circumstances are left undefined as far as exact chronology. But what's happening is something unparalleled, something that's a crisis moment, something that's, that's not only traumatic, but so, so shocking and so upheaving that it's going to define a generation. That's what's happening here. A, a crisis that's going to be both national and personal. And it's described in verse four. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has consumed. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has consumed. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has consumed. That's the crisis. Bugs. Locusts. Not locusts standing for something else. Not a king that's like a locust or an army that moves like a locust. No, these are locusts that move like armies, locusts that are powerful like kings. And as they're described in these first two chapters, uh, if you know anything about grasshoppers, which you know, I'm sure most of you are studying grasshopper science at some point in your college career, uh, you know how devastating these little bugs can be. I mean, they're the kind of, of animal that have devastated uh, other regions in our country in significant ways. If you lived in, in Africa, you would know about the, the plague that is a locust invasion, a swarm of, of one square mile of these creatures uh, can eat the amount of food in a single day that could have fed 80,000 people. That's how devastating these little bugs are. That they can move almost 100 miles a day in these massive swarms. And uh, sometimes they'll, they'll strike generationally. Their, their eggs coming up out of, out of hibernation. And three generations of locusts in 2003 in East Africa decimated agriculture in 23 African countries. Uh, it took two years for them to recover from this. Uh, there's famous stories of, of uh, locust invasions in Egypt, in Palestine, in, in more modern history, in the last few hundred years, that uh, whole societies were upended by uh, the presence of these bugs that consume and eat and, and eat and eat and eat. And uh, the culture, the, the crops, the agriculture, uh, the society is completely undone on every level because of this massive disruption in the food chain and in the supply. And to understand the, the context of the book of Joel and the occasion for this repentance, you have to understand this, this issue pertaining to the bugs and how much trouble they were causing uh, the people. Uh, apparently from Joel chapter two, this was something that didn't happen just in a week, but this was a multi-year problem that was tangled in alongside of a drought. So the devastation wasn't just 
you know, the boats were backed up in Long Beach and, and you have to go to the store in the morning or something like that. There was, there was no food left. And these grasshoppers, these uh, kind of locusts were swarming in such a way that they were overtaking the society. Uh, locusts, I, I was reading a lot about locusts the last few weeks just because I geek out on stuff and you know, it's in any rabbit hole you can fall down on the internet, it's usually a hole you can fall down on the internet. So I'm reading about these locusts and they, there's a part of their life cycle. Described in verse four, I think, the different words to the, the different phases of locusts coming through, uh, they're, they're called, uh, they have something called a gregarious phase. They turn yellow and they're attracted to one another. It's sort of like your college years. Um, <laughs> Not about turning yellow, but you know, you know what I mean. So you're in your gregarious phase. And when they do this, that's when they become problematic because they lay millions of eggs and they, those, these eggs sprout out and cover the entirety of the land. Uh, really to understand this phenomenon though is not the biological understanding that's significant. To understand this, this life cycle of these bugs and how they're impacting the people in Joel's day and the occasion for this call for repentance is to remember that in the book of Deuteronomy, locusts were associated with the curse of God. So sometimes when we in our society hear about uh, natural disasters, we call them, whether it's a, a volcano in Tonga or an earthquake or wildfires or mudslides or, or whatever it is, we kind of think about those in solely a scientific way, you know, tectonic plates or uh, volcanic pressure or, or falling ash or environmental change or something like that. When the people in, in this day uh, found out about a locust plague, they would automatically associate that with Deuteronomy 23, the, the covenant curses that God promised if his people were to be disobedient. You see, whenever there's a, a volcano in this world that erupts and, and takes human life, whenever there's a, a tsunami warning that floods the, the shores of a small island, whenever there's an earthquake that causes a building to fall down, on one level we can understand these things on a, on a basic molecular kind of level, uh, you know, the engineering of the building or the, the lack of a sea wall or, or something like that. But to think about these things on a theological level reminds us that even in the darkest tragic moments, God is still sovereign. And whether the disaster that happens is uh, someone close to you betrays you or your, your father abandons your family or a forest fire burns down a part of a town, all of these things need to be seen through the lens of the absolute sovereignty of God. Nothing comes to us that hasn't passed through the hands of God. You see, it's his meticulous sovereignty that, that filters each thing in our life so that we know that our Father, who is good, is always watching over us. And, and when we dodge a bullet, we always give God credit but when the bullet lodges in our spine, we're usually less prone to do so. You see, we live in a fallen world, and every time lightning strikes and a tsunami floods and a sinner sins, it is a reminder, like a, a thunderclap from heaven, that God hates sin and the world is not as it ought to be. And we can't get out from under the reality that if a locust plague or uh, an unfaithful person or, or whatever it is that's upended your life lately, that is not something that is outside of God's sovereign plan for his people. And so Joel sees these little bugs as an intense destruction sent by God himself. And what maybe makes this even more remarkable, and this could move us towards our second, our second point, which is a sinner's vocation, a bug's life, it's, uh, a bug is under the sovereignty of God. A sinner's vocation is that we have to figure out how to deal with sin in ourselves and in this world. 
And as sinners, they are confronted by this prophet, and he, he tells them to do two things. Primarily, he tells them to cry out to God after looking at the entirety of society, that there's no one untouched by this. The Hebrew language has nine words for locusts, and uh, four of them are used just in verse four. From there, the locusts keep on marching. They're described like an army. They're described by having teeth like lions. Uh, They're uh, ruining the the wedding in verse eight. Uh, Drunkards, who usually are completely oblivious to anything happening in their society, are even impacted by this because there'll be no more wine for seasons to come. Uh, The the priest of society are supposed to lead the people uh, spiritually. They're impacted by this in verse 9. In verse 11, the farmers have obvious impact both economically and on what what they do with their, their whole lives. And so he calls all of this a day of Yahweh, verse 15. And that's a common phrase in the Bible about a a day of judgment, uh, one that happened at any point in in history. So when those locusts came and and invaded, the prophet Joel says it's it's a day of Yahweh. But the prophets always use that in two ways. They talk about whatever particular tragedy has struck now, that this is a sign of God's judgment, but they always see it as a, a, a forerunner or a harbinger or a, 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 a shadow of a greater day in the future called the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord, a day of final and cataclysmic judgment. You see, if sinners have a right view of themselves, any time they see God's judgment in any manifestation in this world, it's a reminder to all of us that God will deal rightly and justly with sin fully and finally. That every day of Yahweh leads up to an ultimate day of Yahweh, a final day of judgment, that sin will always be dealt with by God. And so the two things he calls them to do is to, verse 14 of chapter one, cry out to Yahweh. Verse 19, to cry out to Yahweh. And then getting to our text in verse 12 of chapter two, they're to repent or to return. It's a simple Hebrew word, shub. It just means to make an about face. And that's what God is calling sinners to do. And what's puzzling about this particular invocation to repent, this call to repent, this imperative command that the people need to repent, is they're never told what to repent of. It's not idolatry, uh, apparently, that's never mentioned here. It's not some kind of syncretism in their worship. It's not that their horizontal relationships had lacked justice and they were bad to the widows and the orphans. It's none of the things which you can find in lots of prophets where they are confronting a people for a specific sin, something that is an obvious breaking of the covenant with God. The book of Joel doesn't have that specificity. And so what's puzzling about the call to repentance is they're never told what they're supposed to repent of. But you see, for a a sinner like me and you, that shouldn't be an obstacle. Not only do I have plenty of sins I can repent of, but even when I'm done repenting of those sins, I am well aware of my need to return to the Lord, to be closer to God than I am. And, And I think that's how it's described so often in New Testament terminology, isn't it? I mean, if you think about the book of Revelation and the church of of Ephesus in in Revelation chapter 2, it's that kind of language that their repentance is occasioned on. As he writes to Ephesus, I know your deeds and toil and perseverance, that you cannot bear with those who are evil. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not. You found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. You've also not grown weary, but this I have against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. But if not, I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. 
It's that loss of affection, that loss of, of first love that causes the, the church at Ephesus to receive the rebuke and the call to repentance. And I wonder if it was the, a likewise occasion in Joel's day where the people had grown spiritually disinterested. They'd started to move away from a, a heartfelt affection for God. And look, if that was something that could happen to the people of Israel and their constant rituals of devotion, prescribed and directed by God, daily kinds of sacrifices and grain offerings and wine offerings and, and their dietary restrictions and all the stuff that they did to worship, right? There was a lot of stuff involved in being a, a God-fearing covenant Jew. If all of that could still have them be in a place where a disruption of their worship, like a locust invasion, would expose that their worship had lost some of its heartfelt nature, how much more so could that be a problem at a Christian school like this one? I mean, praise God for chapel three times a week, a, a, an opportunity to refocus your mind on the things of the Lord, to be uh, in the Word with the Spirit working through the Word, to submit yourself to the teaching of the Word of God, to have RD slapping your wrist anytime you do something dumb or whatever. You, you got the, all this like stuff, this, this mechanical, uh, external stuff in your life here at this school that's here to help you, uh, and some of it's in the Bible, some of it's not in the Bible. All of Judaism was in the Bible, at least most of what they were doing at this point in their history, but it, that is not enough to truly keep your affection for the Lord going. And so it's a good reminder for a crowd like this one that when you don't know what to repent of, it's always a good time to return to the Lord. It's always a good time to, to rekindle that heart devotion. I'm thinking of another, another passage. Remember that, that spot in Hebrews chapter two where they're being warned about hardness of heart and uh, about leaving behind their commitment. Hebrews 2, for this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away. He's talking about the, the ultimate word of God manifest in Jesus. And at some point, I, I pray that Jesus himself, the person and work of Christ, has, has captivated your heart, has captured your attention, has in you flamed this passionate love for Christ. But there's times in the course of our lives where that passion is no longer a flame, but maybe just a spark. And so the author of, of Hebrews says, we need to pay closer attention that we might not drift away. It's a nautical term used for a boat that came off the dock. It wasn't anything intentional about it. It was just the nature of currents. The thing drifts away. And so our hearts need to be guarded from this kind of thing. And if a sinner's vocation is repentance, if our life work is being repentant, turning from sin in an about face, from sin to God, if that's our regular habit, then our hearts will be guarded from coldness in Revelation 2, from apathy in Hebrews chapter 2, and in Joel chapter 2, it, it's not that externals don't matter. Look at verse 12. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and wailing. I mean, that, that's all external. Fasting, that's no breakfast burritos. That's an external thing. Wailing, we could all do it right now. Ready? Ah! See, thank you. The, me and that guy wailed. <laughs> weeping. Those of you in the drama department, you can weep on command. Or most sophomore girls. So, it's because your heart is emotional. I don't know what kind of accent that was. It's a sophomore girl accent. So listen, fasting, weeping, and wailing are not bad things. They're prescribed in this text. But they're 
outward manifestations of an inward reality, which is, in verse 12, returning to me with all your heart. The prophet Joel tells the people in verse 13 that they need to not only rend their garments, which would have been part of their uh, external and religious acts of devotion, the tearing of their clothes, the wearing of sackcloth in chapter 1, they were to wear it day and night according to the priest's command. This was a big national cry of repentance, and lots of people can get behind that. Lots of people can involve, get involved in religious exercises and activities, but this This is something happening on a personal and individual level. He wants their clothing torn, but more than their clothing, more than their tears, more than their refraining from food, more than their wailing, more than their external manifestations of sorrow, of this look of religious repentance, he wants it to be from the heart, to return to me with all your heart, a totality of who you are, and that your heart heart would be torn and not just your garments. This is when repentance is real. This is the difference described in 1 Corinthians, uh, in 2 Corinthians 6 and 7, uh, the passage that is contrasting worldly sorrow and genuine repentance. It's not that genuine repentance has no external evidence. It's that genuine repentance is both interior and exterior, which starts within, comes without. Tear your heart. That's the predominant concern, not your garments. He gives them eight, I think there's eight or so imperatives starting in verse 15 that all reinforce the reality of this this true repentance. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Set apart a fast as holy. Call for a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Set apart the congregation as holy. Assemble the elders. Gather infants. Let the bridegroom come to his room, the bride at her bridal chamber. Priests, ministers of Yahweh, weep between the porch and the altar. Say, pity your people, O Yahweh. Do not, this is a prayer, do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is your God? I mean, all of this is called for, but every bit of it finds its root in a heart awareness of our need for true and genuine restoration to our God. When the disasters of life appear, bugs or boyfriends, whatever they are, sometimes they're both, those things are intended by God to urge you towards true and lasting change in your heart. Every day of the Lord, every day of the exposure of sin, the judgment of God, the the discipline that God exercises in his people and in the church points towards a greater day. Therefore, every repentance that we experience for words we shouldn't have said, things that we've neglected in our relationship to others and to God, should lead towards a a manifestation of a heart that's so tender that the individual acts of repentance are easy for us. We're not hard to confront, we're not not difficult to admonish because we have this constant awareness of our need to guard over our hearts, to to watch ourselves, to to guard against sin. And and, and the true repentance described in verses 12 and, and 13 has both the formal and outward expressions that correspond with the interior expressions. I mean, just to give you another one, Hosea 14, it's just probably a page back in your Bible, starting in verse one. Return, O Israel, to Yahweh your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words with you and return to Yahweh. Say to him, forgive all iniquity and take what is good, that we might pay in full the fruit of our lips. Assyria will not save us, will not ride on horses, nor will we again say our God to the work of our hands, for in you the orphan finds compassion. 
I mean, this confession and acknowledgement of sin and appeal to God is completely on the basis of what should be our third and, and final point, which is uh, the character of our God or the heart of our God. You see, not only is our sin exposed here, even though it's not specifically named and, and true repentance is described, but the incentive for true repentance is in 13, verse 13 and 14 of Joel chapter 2, and it has everything to do with who God is. And this is, for some reason, a theologically controversial passage in the Bible, but I don't think it needs to be. Verse 13, tear your heart and not your garments. Now return, that's the same word for repent, to turn to Yahweh your God. Why? Why ought you turn to God? Why, when disaster strikes, should you turn your heart to God? Well, you could say because you need it, because sin devastates your life, and there's ample evidence of that all around you. But more significantly, return to God because of who he is. Verse 13 in the middle, return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting concerning evil. What a fascinating description of the heart of God. Jesus said that this is what his heart is like. He's meek and lowly. He urges sinners to come to him, and the posture of Jesus isn't arms crossed, and, you know, you better give me a good list of why I should forgive you, and kind of, you know, how, how legit is your repentance? I'd like you to write some stuff down for me. The posture of Jesus is arms wide open towards sinners. He's not wagging his finger at you. And the posture of Jesus is that way because that's the exact disposition of God. The God who just sent a devastating plague of, of locusts to his people to, the word in the chapter one is awaken them. Sometimes we talk about revivals, you know, like a spiritual renewal in a place or a time. Uh, sometimes those are called awakenings, like in the Great Awakening, and it's a good word because it's, a, it's an opening of your eyes. It's an awareness of the reality of how things really are. That's what's happening here. And it's happening because of who God is. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger, abounding in has said that's that loving kindness, that workhorse attribute of God, that, that loyalty and affection uh, that comes together so often, almost as much as the word holiness in the Old Testament, you find that word has said hundreds of times describing God, his loving kindness, his, his loyal love, his covenant fidelity. It's why the nature of God described here, the characteristics of God described here are the exact same characteristics of God that were revealed to Moses, that were revealed to Abraham, and that were revealed when God sent his dear son. God is always this way. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding, abundant in loving kindness, in loyal love. And he has a tendency to repent as well. So what it says he relents concerning evil. Look, it's not talking about the purpose of God. God has an unchangeable purpose. It's talking about a reversal of their circumstances from God's perspective. I mean, Samuel, we see that God doesn't repent like man repents, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't turn from our perspective. You see, he's calling these people to contrition, to genuine sorrow for their sin, to Psalm 51, 17 kind of stuff, a broken spirit, a contrite heart, a broken and contrite heart. These are the sacrifices of God. These are the things he doesn't despise. He's calling these people to a turning, to a converting, to a, a return to their affection for God. And, and the, the motivation in this thing is is that God may turn as well. Verse 14, who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. 
that doesn't impugn on the sovereignty of God or on His eternal decree. It's a reminder that when God brings judgment, He's just as likely. In fact, it's His reputation to follow that judgment with extraordinary mercy and grace, to restore sinners, to help sinners, to heal sinners. This is what God does. Listen to what Jim Boyce says about this, that God often changes his intention to judge sin and instead repents and shows mercy is a problem for some persons. They ask, how can the unchanging God change his mind? How can God repent? That may be a problem for our thinking, but it is important to note that it is no problem for God. God does not explain his repentance. He simply states that he does repent and he holds this possibility out to get us to turn from sin. God is gracious. God does relent from sending calamity. He has delayed his judgments and turned back his wrath. That's why a awakening is not just a, a hope, but a real possibility. Friend, when the bugs come out, when the bottom drops out, when life shakes, know that God is in it. He's in it to call you back to himself so that your genuine heartfelt disposition towards God will be renewed and made fresh, that your love would be genuine and real. And know that the, the reason, the motivation for that kind of genuine repentance is always based in who our God is. And our God is truly good and truly merciful and kind to sinners like us. Joel goes on as he describes the future to move away from this dark day where locusts covered the ground. And he looks forward to that day of judgment, but that's not the only thing Joel looks forward to in his prophecy. He looks forward to a time in chapter two where he describes their young men will dream dreams and their, their old men will have visions and God will pour out his spirit on all mankind and daughters will prophesy and and slaves will receive his spirit. And it's just this wild prophecy in Joel 2, 28 and 29 of an outpouring of the spirit of God. And that becomes a text, a text that Peter couldn't resist preaching on the day of Pentecost. You see, Joel knows in part that God will use the repentance of his people to bring about his greater spiritual purposes. What he only realized in part was that this was all contributing, not just towards a great eschatological day of judgment, but towards a great eschatological day of abundant rejoicing and salvation when God at Pentecost would give his spirit to all those who would trust in Jesus. That would be a foretaste of every tribe and tongue and nation. That the little repentance demonstrated in the true heart of an Israelite after a locust plague would find resonance in the hearts of a bunch of students on campus at a Christian college in California because their hearts would turn back to God. You see, this prophecy becomes not just about judgment, about God's plan in redeeming a bride and in gathering a people to himself, a people who will worship God, repent of their sin, no matter what happens in their life because they see it all as coming through the hand of God. Father, thank you for these students and thank you for your word. We need to be confronted by the adverse circumstances of life so that our hearts would not drift from you. Thank you for the prophet's message. Help us to see ourselves in that mirror and to long to be drawn back to a place of recognizing your grace and compassion and mercy.
In Jesus' matchless name, amen.